Um, so, but gases. So, and to talk about gases, we got some new things to talk about so that we don't always talk about with everything else. The biggest two things are pressure and volume. So first off, pressure. What is the technical definition or the mathematical definition of pressure? Force divided by area. Yeah, it's force per area, force per area. Now let's say I got super mad at Thomas. And I don't know why I got super mad at Thomas, but I took this Sharpie marker and I stabbed him as hard as I could in his skull. Is this likely to pierce his skull? You think, what if I hit him as hard as I can? Probably not. No, not so much. What if, instead of this lovely thing, I took a knife and I stabbed him in the skull as hard as I can with a super sharp knife? Is that likely to pierce his skull? Yes. Why? Because it's a sharp object. object. What does that mean in terms of this? The, it's about the area over which that force applied. And the force is no different. I hit him as hard as I could, either case, applying the same force, but with a much smaller area where the knife hits, it generates a much larger pressure. So the pressure is proportional to the force, but it's inversely proportional to the area. A smaller area leads to a larger pressure. Cool. What are some of the units we use for pressure? Yeah, definitely atmospheres is probably by and large the most common one we'll see here. What else is out there though? I saw it. What's that? Kilopascal. Yeah, kilopascal or pascal. So, and that's a little less common, but it's 101,325 pascal, or 101.325 kilopascal, but we're probably not going to use that a whole lot. In a physics class, that's actually technically the SI unit is the pascal, but we won't use it a whole lot in this class, right? So what else is there, though, that we might see? So you might see bar, you might see tor, you might see millimeters of mercury. So in this case, so actually, there are 760 millimeters of mercury is the equivalent of one atmosphere, or same diff, 760 tor. So, and then one bar is almost the same as one atmosphere. You might see that as well. Hey, Bree. Cool. So this conversion right here is probably worth knowing. It'll show up again. Fair chance it'll show up on the front, of the front page of your exam, but probably one you just might want to have in the back of your head anyways. So the other thing we talk about commonly for gases that we may not talk about, so for other things, is volume. So what is special about gases in regard to volume as compared to, say, a liquid or a solid? What, is a, what does a gas do? So if it doesn't have a defined shape, then where does it get its shape from? Well, it fills the volume of whatever container it's in. Notice, a liquid doesn't necessarily find shape, but it, don't, it won't necessarily fill the entire container, right? If you put just a little bit of water in a glass, it doesn't spread out to fill the whole glass, whereas a gas does. If you put a little bit of gas in a big room, it will spread out to fill the room as much as it can. So it takes the shape of whatever container it has. So, and we'll see different units for volume, and you know, you're familiar with those, and liters and milliliters would be pretty common on the metric side. So, and yeah, we could use like gallons and stuff on the American side, but we hardly ever do. So not gonna see it a whole lot. Um, let's talk about why there is pressure. So it's force per area. So if I have a container here with a sample of a gas in it, why is there pressure? What's causing the pressure? What's causing the force? Good, good. Collisions with the walls of the container. And so in this case, you get a collision with the wall, you get a collision with the wall. So, and as the molecules bounce off the walls, that applies a pressure. So, and as long as you have, you know, molecules on the outside colliding with the walls exactly the same, then great, there's a balance there. So, and nothing happens to this lovely container. So there used to be a professor back a while who used to take a big 55 gallon container, one of those big 55 gallon blue drums. So, and he'd fill it full of superheated steam. So before class, long before any students would show up. And then he would just throw it off into the side of the room and leave it there. And students would file in, so, and he'd start teaching. And pretty soon though, the superheated steam would get colder and colder. And as soon as it hits 100 degrees, all the water molecules, the steam molecules, what would happen to them once the temperature dropped below 100 degrees Celsius? They would condense, and all of a sudden the gas molecules that were up here bouncing around inside that 55 gallon drum were all down here. And they're 
largely weren't a whole lot of gas molecules up here at all. And all of a sudden now, you had molecules pressing in, but no gas molecules pressing out. What would that look like? Condensation, is that what you're asking? What, say that one more time. Condensation. Condensation, well the condensation happens, but what would it physically look like if I had the 55 gallon blue drum sitting over there? Yeah, it would look like boom! Oh gosh, just kidding. So, so it would make, the whole thing implodes and makes a super loud sound that does exactly that. It just scares the crap out of everybody. So, and there's the key. All of a sudden the pressure inside is lower than the pressure outside and it implodes. So same kind of thing here, but pressure is due to the collisions by the walls of the container. When we start looking at some of the different gas laws, we'll kind of relate it back to what is the nature of pressure. So, and how can you maybe increase it, decrease it, things of a sort, and how might it affect the volume? So start there. Um, cool. So if we take a look now, so at the ideal gas law, we're going to take a look at the ideal gas law. So first of all, what is the ideal gas law? Just what is it? What's the equation? Cool. PV equals nRT. So PV equals nRT, right? P stands for? Pressure. pressure. V stands for? Volume, volume N? Moles. moles of what? Moles of gas. Got to be moles of gas. R? So it's the gas constant, the universal gas constant. T? Temperature. temperature. What is the universal gas constant? Uh, 0.08. Cool. What are the units on that? Good. So if you use this value of R, which is pretty typical, then you have to use these units. So assuming you use this value of R, what units for pressure do you have to use? Atmospheres. What units for volume? Liters. What units for temperature? Kelvin. So we talked about it at the exam two review session. If you're using delta T, with delta T, it really doesn't matter if you use Celsius or Kelvin, truth be told. But for just about everywhere else in all of chemistry, when you're using temperature, you better use Kelvin. So, and in this chapter, that's really, really important. Always do any calculations involving temperature in Kelvin. We'll see this time and again throughout the night. So this is the ideal gas law. So why do they call it the ideal gas law? So what assumptions? There's assumptions? What assumptions? And there are. Good. The assumptions we make for an ideal gas are not necessarily always true, or even always completely true, or ever completely true. So an ideal gas is kind of like the ideal man. He doesn't really exist. Right, Thomas? <laughs> Thomas is like, well, there's one. Just so you know, it's me. Right, Thomas? Yeah. And by saying it's me, I mean it's you. Yeah. So just making sure you got that. All right. Because my wife would definitely tell you that it's not me. <laughs> so assumptions. So what are the two big assumptions? And technically, there's a little more than two assumptions. There's the whole kinetic molecular theory. But so there are two big assumptions for ideal gases that I want to talk about. What are those two? Gases behave more ideally at low pressure and high temperature? Well, those aren't the assumptions. Uh, That's when, and it's actually a result of uh, those assumptions. Right. But what are the actual assumptions? Gas molecules do not have volume. Good. Cool, so gas molecules don't have volume. They have no volume. So that's an assumption we make. And the idea is this, if you look at a gas, so, and if you compare that to say a solid or liquid, in a typical solid or liquid, the atoms or molecules are right next to each other. In a solid, they're in a fixed location. They vibrate a little bit, but they're fixed. In a liquid, they're right next to each other. They're touching, but they're just moving all around each other and you know, fluidly flowing around, if you will. But in a gas, when you go from a liquid to a gas at any kind of normal you know, pressure, so those molecules spread out by huge amounts of empty space. And so under most conditions, most normal conditions, a gas is made up of mostly empty space. And so the little teeny tiny molecules separated by huge amounts of empty space, they don't take up much room, much volume at all. Well, for ideal gases, we round out the little amount that they take up, we round out down to zero. And we just say it's zero. Is it really truthfully zero? No. But 
it's not a bad approximation under most conditions. And so that's the first assumption we make. It's never 100% true, but under many conditions, it's like 99.999% true, so, and stuff like that. Okay, so assumption number two. So, and you said this one as well. And this is there are no attractive forces between molecules. There are no attractive forces between molecules. So as you guys learned in one of the next chapters here, all molecules really are a little bit sticky. And so this idea that there's no attractive forces between molecules is never 100% true. So hey, Brie, could you hand her one of those as well? Awesome. So this is never 100% true. So molecules are always a little bit sticky. There's the London dispersion forces, the dipole-dipole forces, potentially hydrogen bonding, things like those, those intermolecular forces you learned about. So this is never 100% true. However, under many conditions, it's kind of true. So and the idea is this. Notice, if two molecules have an attraction for each other, if I bring them together really slowly, they might just stick, right? So if, say it was two magnets. I bring two magnets together slowly, they're going to stick eventually, not if you drop one of them anyways. So, however, if I took those same two magnets and hurled them towards each other at 1,000 miles an hour each, when they collide, do you think they'll stick? No, they'll probably have so much kinetic energy, they're just going to bounce right off each other. Same idea here with molecules. Even though they really do have some attractive forces, if they're moving fast enough, they'll have enough kinetic energy to overcome those when they collide and just bounce right off. And so these assumptions are never true, but there are conditions when they are more true than others. So when would this be more true then? Higher temperatures. Molecules are moving faster the higher the temperature. And so assumption number two here is a better assumption at high temps. So a good assumption at high temperatures. And room temperature, you know, you're like 25 degrees Celsius. And you know, right now, room temperature feels pretty darn nice compared to 115 outside, right? So however, room temperature even is considered rather high, like 298 Kelvin, that's a pretty high temperature actually. So, and even higher, obviously, even more so. Um, gas molecules have no volume. So let's say, you know, in a, if we took a, a super microscope here and took an amplified look at a, a sample of a gas. If, let's say, in a room this size, gas molecules were the size of marbles. In a room this size, we might be able to fit like 10 marbles throughout the room, just spread out, bouncing off the walls and stuff like that, but 10 marbles. The volume of the gas would be the volume of the entire room. The volume of the molecules would be the volume of 10 marbles. Would it be a good assumption in that case to say that the molecules have no volume? Would that be a good approximation? Yes, would it be 100% correct? No, but it's a pretty good approximation. But let's say I jack up the pressure. I jack up the pressure, and I fit those same 10 gas molecules into this cup. So squeeze them all together. Is it a good assumption to say that the molecules have a take up a negligible amount of volume in this case? No, now all of a sudden 10 marbles takes up a good chunk of the space in here, and to round that down to zero is not a good assumption. And so in this case, when is it a good assumption to say that gas molecules have no volume? Low pressures, in this case. So low pressures. And so overall, based on these two assumptions, we can derive that gases tend to behave more ideally, they give more ideal behavior at low pressures and high temperatures. This is totally something to remember. You may simply get a question that just says, under which of the following conditions is a gas most likely to behave like an ideal gas? Great, find the lowest pressure and highest temperature combination. Or you may get it asked exactly the opposite way around. You may get a question that says, under which of the following conditions is a gas most likely to deviate from ideal behavior. So in that case, then just look for the lowest temperature and the highest pressure, the exact opposite. Cool, no worries. So somebody make sure she gets a review sheet as well. Any questions before we move on here? Okay, you need to know these two assumptions and you need to know when they're most valid. 
Cool, so we kind of said this already. So, but that ideal behavior. Is more likely when? What conditions? Good. Ideal behavior is more likely associated with low pressure and high temperature. And again, if you were given a gas and it says under which of the following conditions is it most likely to display ideal behavior, look for the combination of the lowest pressure and highest temperature. Or again, they could ask it backward and say which one is most likely to deviate from ideal behavior. Well then, in that case, pick the highest pressure and the lowest temperature. Okay. The other way they could go about this, though, is they could say which of the following gases, and they could give you like, you know, let's just go down the list, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and steam, and say which of the following gases is most likely to behave like an ideal gas or most likely to deviate from ideal behavior. They could go either way. So, and if you look here, it's talking about how these gases all violate one of the assumptions. None of the assumptions is ever 100% true. And the assumption you want to zero in on when comparing these is the assumption about attractive forces. What is the ideal gas assumption we make about attractive forces? That there are none. There are none. Do these really have zero intermolecular forces? No. But whichever one has the least will therefore most satisfy that ideal gas assumption and most act like an ideal gas. Or whichever one has the most intermolecular forces will then behave least like an ideal gas. And so my question, first question, is which one of these will behave least like an ideal gas? You guys remember your intermolecular forces yet? You might have them, or you might get them tomorrow, huh? Cool, it turns out it's water. Anybody know what intermolecular force water has? Hydrogen bonding. Because of his hydrogen bonding, and they don't have it, he's got overall the greatest intermolecular forces of any of these five compounds. And as having the highest intermolecular forces, he'll behave least, we'll just call it least, ideally. And so notice here, this is a great question because it ties in concepts from two different chapters that are both on this exam. Yeah, it's got the greatest over, so the hydrogen bonding, we'll see in a little bit, is the greatest intermolecular force we're going to talk about. And since they don't have it, and he does, and we'll explain what it is in a little bit, so it's the OH bond that results in it. So he's got the greatest intermolecular forces. Ideal gases don't have them. Since he's got the greatest intermolecular forces, then he's the least like an ideal gas, behave the least ideally. Now, the rest of these, they're all nonpolar means they don't have hydrogen bonding, they don't even have dipole-dipole forces. The only thing they have is the relatively weak London dispersion forces. Well, London dispersion forces are dependent upon size. The bigger you are, the more you have. So whichever one of these is the smallest will have the lowest overall intermolecular forces. Which of these is the smallest? Helium. And as a result, he will behave the most like an ideal gas. So again, when you're comparing different compounds, it's all about the assumption that ideal gases don't have intermolecular forces. A lot of students try and look at the two assumptions and be like, well, maybe it's about size, maybe it's about molecular volume, don't go there. It's all about which one has either the highest or lowest intermolecular forces when you're comparing different compounds.